Well, OC has had a, uh, a strong outreach at the uh, University of Tennessee. And uh, if you've ever heard Paul, he's a great speaker, and very interesting program, I'm sure. So. Hi, y'all. Say hi back. Hi. Hi back. Hi. 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 <laughs> okay, let me get this started up here. It's not explosive. Please don't unscrew the screw and let the stuff out. Jerry. <laughs> 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 I'm figuring I'll get back there and go, I'll show you. Today's talk, to, uh, actually, can you turn the problems off? I'm sorry? Lights, yeah. Yeah, that's, we got enough light, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to show this now. How many of you are familiar with Alan Friedman? Friedman. There is a good chance that you, if you have not, you most certainly will see his images of the sun uh, on, see what that, that will show up in there. So what you have to do, turn lights back on. Can, I don't know if you can see it or not. Can you see the magnetic field in here? Mm -hmm. yeah. see the color. It's a dipole magnet in the center. There's iron filing suspended in some kind of oil. Keep your finger in there to keep the magnet from falling out. Yeah, how cool is that? Okay, Earth has one of those. The sun has one of those. And the title of the talk is the solar system from the sun to Pluto. And we're going to talk first a little bit about the effect uh, that the sun's magnetic field can have on us and, and stuff around it and so forth. And so I, I, I give kudos to Mr. Friedman for his fantastic uh, solar astrophotography. Uh, Terry called me at 1130 Thursday and said, you got to go out and look at the sun. There was a, a, an eruptive prominence. And uh, when I got outside, the big show was over. Uh, that was about 2.30 in the afternoon. And uh, you got to see part of what was going on. And Alan Friedman happened to be ph photographing the sun that, that morning. He's testing the camera. Yeah, 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 that's right. I went and looked up the camera, by the way. It's so expensive, they don't show the price. You got to ask him? It's got like a, a gigapixel pixel number of things on it, and it's huge. And, and, and the imagery, I can't even imagine. If that's what he's been using, they've had that camera for a while. If that's how he's been taking these, I'll never own one. I don't know what his, I don't know what his telescopes are. I don't have no idea what the guy's got, but my God, it's amazing. So this is actually, I, I was given permission to use his images, and I've already messed with it. Uh, this actually should be rotated this way, and the filament, uh, the, or the prominence, which is an eruptive prominence, this thing's already lifted off. Uh, should be going up, but I couldn't make the text work, so I rotated it. So if you'll forgive me for that. Um, he sells his work online, and I gotta tell you, you just need to Google Alan Friedman and just go on his website and look at his stuff. It's absolutely amazing. There's another uh, another couple in here that you're gonna see. But uh, anyway, I wanted just to get around the room as everybody's seeing this magnetic field. It's pretty much collapsing around the magnet now. But you, you can still see the field lines, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, you can't shake it up with a magnet. You got to take the magnet out and give it a good stir, and then, and then, uh, and then it'll show up again. But it's about the best way I know to show. Yeah, exactly. The magnetic field, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the significance of that. So, has it been down this side of the room? Okay. So you guys are the last ones. Okay. Let him take a closer picture, and then uh, we'll turn the lights off. He's got iron filings. Picture or movie? <laughs> what? No, 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 no. I bought that. That's uh, I don't mean I don't even remember what they cost. There's a couple of different versions of. There's some dry versions of it too. They make a, a, pl a plexiglass. Uh, it's two sheets with a little gap between them, and they put iron filings in it. You take magnets and stick underneath and around and all like that. That's kind of, that's a really cool way to show it too. That's the easiest and least expensive way is to get a bar magnet. Lay it on a table, put a piece of paper over it, just sprinkle iron filings, and you can get them from your local brake shop because they'll give them to you as shavings off of, off the rotors. Uh, 
they need a little fine when you step in with them. That too, yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay, so just remember this. This is important. Light speed. Okay, so we're going to start with the sun. Uh, first of all, if you haven't heard something about the sun in the last, I don't know, six, eight, ten weeks, then you've been in a cave. Uh, because it's really, really beginning to stir up. Uh, we waited for an incredibly, we had the, one of the longest minimums, dry spells, we've had a long time. Uh, and it just seemed like it was never going to end. And then all of a sudden, one day, whoopee, somebody turned a switch on on the sun and it went nuts. And then it settled down a little bit, then it'd get crazy a little bit, then it'd get stirred up again. This guy right here has been the most interesting sunspot group in a very long time. How many of you know the number 1429? I know you do. This is the one that was spitting off all those X-Class flares just about three weeks ago, I think it was. And I've got some video of that in here. This is a still, this is an SDO. SDO is a Solar Dynamics Observatory. Uh, and it's got four cameras on it, and they got different kind of filter sets and whatnot. They shoot all different wavelengths, and they are taking images at a rate of about one every 10 seconds, which in the past, we were taking images about one every 10 or 15 minutes. So when you strung those together, one, you had to have a whole lot of images to make a movie. But when you did, you were making movies with tremendous gaps between the frames, and there was a lot of information that was being missed. And SDO has taken the guesswork out of what happens in between. So the next, uh, this is a movie, uh, and, and I want you to watch a couple of things. Um, when we look at the sun through a white light filter, we see three basic things. We see the photosphere, that's this. That's where the gases are so dense that they become opaque, we can't see any further into the sun. The other things that we, but the three things that we see in the photosphere are sunspots, limb darkening, and faculae, these guys. And the, the quick and dirty is sunspots are cooler places on the sun. They can last anywhere from minutes to days to weeks. Uh, there was a sunspot group that I watched for six weeks back in 1989. It was one of the three largest groups ever recorded. I didn't know that for about 15 years. And I have a picture of that, and I still use that picture today because it's the best picture of the sun. I just got lucky one morning. We had a thunder shower, the clouds parted, and I took a picture, wow. And, and I haven't taken one that's that good since. Uh, and I've really tried hard too, but it just hadn't happened. And you can see every bit of this in that image. Uh, and then, uh, so we have the sunspots, the dark centers, the umbra, the lighter surrounding regions of the penumbra. The center of the spot is where the greatest magnetic field strength is. So that's where it impedes the convection process the most. So the heat energy from below can't heat the gases. So they're not radiating the same temperature as the surrounding area. So the dark, or the center is dark because it's cooler. It's a contrast thing. Uh, as you move out from the center of the spot, you go away from the greatest magnetic field strength. The temperature goes up. So when you go from here, from the center, out through that lighter region, the temperature goes up, the magnetic field strength goes down, until you get the average surface temperature of the sun, which is about 5,700 Kelvin, or about 10,400 degrees Fahrenheit. And no, the conversion is not times two. It just worked out on that particular number. Uh, here's a small group. Most sunspot groups are bipolar. There's not a medication for it. but. What happens is over time, that's, that field will actually break down or, or it'll get bigger, and, and, and you're going to see that happen here. This is so cool. Uh, that's 1429 right there. And I don't normally take, pay attention to sunspot, the, the designations for the different groups. You couldn't ignore this thing because we got to watch it every single day on spaceweather.com. If you're not familiar with spaceweather.com, you're just, your life is just passing you by. You have to go look on spaceweather.com at least once a week, if not once a day. I do it a couple of times a day. But uh, uh, it's really a cool website. Okay, so sunspots, limb darkening. This is the 3D part. This is the multimedia part of the presentation on this. The sun is a sphere, okay? And when we go outside on a clear day and we look up, what do we see? No. Clear day outside, no clouds. What's what's straight up? Think of a color. Blue. Okay. When you go to the horizon, what happens to that blue? It gets lighter. And the reason is because we're going. NASA says we look straight up, 62 miles, and this is just for our purposes here. This is the thickness of the Earth's atmosphere. Take an apple, an average apple. The skin of the apple represents the thickness of the Earth's atmosphere. 
Okay, so let's say for our purposes that the atmosphere is this thick. That's 62 miles. So when you look straight up, yeah. you're seeing, you know, suns, the light is scattered, refracted, and all those other things that happen to it, and the sky looks blue. When we look toward the horizon, we're looking through this much air. So because we look so much, because we look through so much more air, uh, and we're seeing more particulate matter in the atmosphere, it lightens up a little bit. Well, think of that sort of in reverse, looking at the sun. We look through the center of the disk, we're looking through that much cooler, thinner atmosphere in the upper part of the photosphere. But when you look out here, you're looking through this much atmosphere. So this is absorbing energy at about the same temperature from below, so it gets darker. So that's limb darkening. Now the artifact that we see as a result of limb darkening is this bright splotchy stuff. And these are called faculae. So wherever there's a sunspot, you're impeding the convection process. The energy can't come out here. Where does it go? Well, it's coming out in this stuff. You, you will find a lot of facula activity, faculae around sunspot groups. And though you can't follow it across the disk, you can watch what happens to the evolution of the magnetic field of the sunspot groups. And that's what I want you to watch when I set this thing up. It's in a loop. So somewhere you gotta get them. Oh, there it is. And it won't be there when I go to the But Watch this, you'll see that that'll just disappear to the frame of one now. Or no, it's when this gets over here. Watch what happens as this thing just sort of moves apart. Watch that one first. You can see it just sort of moving all over the place. Some of the spots completely disappear. New ones form all of a sudden. The penumbra is really active around that spot. Okay, here it comes again. Watch this one. This is basically two weeks from limb to limb. What's the frame rate? I don't know. I have no idea. I just know it's an SDO movie. And you can see a lot of faculty in this group as it first comes around the limb. You can see a lot associated with this one too. Those just popped up out of nowhere. You were saying the SDO took a lot of gas work out of the gaps. So how often are they? About every 10 seconds, but I, there's missing data in this film, so I don't know. I don't know how many frames they use. Some of them might not be any good. Uh, I really don't know. They don't give. They don't feed that information with these. But this is one of the best movies I've seen them put out. So just uh, this time, just watch as this one emerges. This one's going to be over here, and you'll see this one come out. But look at all of the faculty that's that's around it. A lot of hot gas. But all the while, this thing's moving across the disk. All kinds of solar flares, coronal mass ejections were happening. You can see the other one over there as it comes around. So this has just been within the last month. Okay. Now, <coughs> same sunspot group, 1429, as it was in that last frame, as you saw it sort of blank out over here. This is 1429. This is the day it went around the bend. Watch right in here. You can see loops, 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 and then kaboom. They, they just explode open, the energy flows out, and there's a period called reconnection where the magnetic field actually comes back together and it's kind of this well. Watch it happen again, boom. The field breaks open, and watch the reconnection as this cascade of loops forms. It's not a place you want to be. <laughs> Absolutely not. This is an ultraviolet. But you can see, boom, lift off. So we had a chrome mass ejection with it too. Uh, it was once thought for a while that when we have solar flares, or that if we had a chrome mass ejection, that it was caused by solar flare. That's not true. There are associations between solar flares and chrome mass ejections, but one doesn't necessarily mean the other one had to be there first or vice versa. Uh, that got ruled out several years ago. Chrome mass ejections were only first discovered in about 1973 or 74. Uh, and accidentally, because there was a piece of film, you used to send these cameras up in space, they take film, then they parachute back down, they catch them, and then they look at the film. They're in a processing lab and they see this little white bubble around the edge of the disk of the sun in this one particular image. And they thought, there's something wrong with that. Just threw it away and made another one. Same bubble. Then they recognized, well, that's in the film. 
well, let's go to the next frame. Well, the next frame was bigger and farther from the sun. And then they got to look and it kept doing that, just bigger and farther, bigger and farther. And it's like blowing up a balloon, letting it go, but it keeps blowing up as it moves away from the sun. And so coronal mass ejections, where solar flares, there's a difference between these. Solar flares, as you can see, happen up in these loops. Watch it break open. Bam, right here. Okay, the magnetic field fell apart and reconnected. That was a flare, but it was also followed by a coronal mass ejection. A flare is a localized event. It usually happens in an arch, a, a magnetic arch. And all this energy has been stored up in these magnetic fields beneath the surface. And you can see how these things are sort of intertwined. They rub up against each other. Uh, they're just unbelievably energetic. Then all of a sudden, wham, they let all, all that energy go at one time. And you get these high energy particles, protons and electrons, go racing across the solar system at a couple of million miles per hour. They hit that magnetic field I passed around, which is Earth's first line of defense. We sort of have three. We have the greater magnetic field, the Van Allen belts, and then Earth's atmosphere. So we're always flying shields us. <laughs> have to get that Star Trek reference in. Well, she was into next gen. Next generation, really? <laughs> Ask her about that. Hey, no, I feel like it's <laughs> hey, I'm a DS9 guy. <laughs> okay, so here's a schematic of the sun. Uh, you can see here where the magnetic field's blown open, and then this is probably a flare and a coronal mass ejection. Think of a boat going across the water. And as the boat moves across the water, you see this bow shock wave out in front of it. The, 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 the first piling up of the water out front, that's the bow shock wave. That's this guy, that's the leading edge of this bubble of high energy particles that are leaving the sun. Well, here's the Earth's magnetic field, what we passed around. The, uh, the magnetic field lines that you can see. Well, you can see that it's compressed on this side and it's strung out on the other side. So we got, it's constantly com compressed by the solar wind. These are particles that are moving off of the sun all the time anyway. But when we have these big bumps in the road or the solar flares and the coronal mass ejections, the coronal mass ejections and the solar flares and, and, and I'm going to do another talk on this next weekend, but it's going to be a whole lot more on this and less on some of the stuff I'm going to talk about in here. But I just want to touch briefly on it. The magnetic field that you saw here is the same as this, but internally it's all, it winds up like a clock spring because the sun rotates differentially. They rotate like a solid body like the earth. So our magnetic field, dipole field, though in three dimensions it goes all the way around the globe and it's compressed on one side, it's basically a dipole field. It's not wound up like the sun's is. The winding up of the magnetic field is sort of like winding up the jack-in-the-box. And when it just can't stand it anymore, you hit the button and boing, out pops the, 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 the clown or whatever, in this case, coronal mass ejections, high energy particles, and across the solar system it goes. Bam, it slams the nearest magnetic field. It's not a rigid structure. It's like jello. It does this. Well, when it does that, it produces currents in the earth. When it produces currents in the earth, it creates problems with the power grid. Everybody knows that our power grid is not what our power grid should be. We haven't kept it up like we should. Uh, it's overtaxed in the summertime. We use far more energy than we're producing sometimes. We have those days we have rolling blackouts like in different parts of the country. We've had them in East Tennessee from time to time. We're really cold in the winter and they've had to sort of trim down on the businesses downtown. I know they've done that in downtown Knoxville. The university has tried to do it when we've seen extensive use of the power grid there. The problem with it is that when these guys slam into the Earth's magnetic field, they produce those currents, all of our grids are interconnected. So if one goes down, that one over there back feeds into this one, at least to keep emergency services up and running. But if that fails, since we're overtaxed to begin with, in more ways than one, but if, <laughs> if, if you go off into the grid and you realize that we're taking power from other parts of the grid just to keep us going and one of them goes down, then you can have a cascade failure. Well, there was a study done by a group in Oak Ridge in conjunction with NASA and several other institutions that have determined that we have a, we're facing a potential serious problem and a long-term serious problem if our power grid doesn't get some much needed help. The, ba the bottom line of it is, without going into a lot of details, is we can spend a billion dollars and fix it, or we can spend a trillion dollars and fix it later, because that's how much damage can be done. Uh, how many of you remember the, the Quebec uh, meltdown in 1989? Have you seen pictures of that transformer? 
the, the plates of the transformer actually infused into a bottle. That transformer costs $10 million. They don't make them and put them on the shelf like the little transformers we use in like your light and so forth. You can't go to you can't go down to the hardware store and buy one of those transformers. They're handmade and they are made by specialists. They, GE doesn't crank these out like jet engines. So 10 million bucks a pop, if you have a cascade failure, you're not going to be down like you are for a thunderstorm for a couple hours a day, maybe ice storm a week at the outside, two maybe. No, we're talking about six months to two years. I have for 10 years of that would be. If it, 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 the, the big, I didn't include the picture here, it'll be in the program next week. But there's a, there's a line that's drawn around 131 million people in the eastern half of the United States that can't be affected by a cascade failure. And so that's why that's why studying the sun is so important so that we can understand what little what little signals do we get from the sun that tell us something like this is going to happen and how do we prepare ourselves to deal with it so well that's a that's a whole other so here's a if you if you do an x y and z this is in the plus z axis looking down on the sun this is earth this is magnetic field of the sun, and there's a couple of interesting things in these three different movies. Here's a coronal mass ejection. As you can see, we didn't catch this thing directly. Here's where directly is right here. But you can see us get brushed right there, okay? Watch the magnetic field of the sun get whipped around by this thing. That passes through the earth. And it's taking up, it's like cracking a whip. <coughs> and then out here, if we just look at the piece that went through, passed through the earth, as you can see right here as it passes by, that's that burst that you see. Boom, right there. And there it is again. This is what we face every time a large coronal mass ejection heads toward the Earth. If, it's, if, if you look at these images from SOHO, for instance, there's a camera called Lasco on SOHO. That's the one that has the blue disc that you see with the dark occulting disc in the center. The little white circle is the true diameter of the sun. And you see these coronal mass ejections shooting off in all these directions. They got a red one, they got a blue one. The blue one is the wide angle one. <coughs> this, I'm not, this is Gong. I think this is Soho. Uh, but uh, uh, at any rate, uh, Soho is the one that's got Lasco on it that takes that other picture where you can see these look like blasts of gas coming off of the sun. And um, when you see one going off to the right or the left or up or down, it's not coming toward us directly. But if you see a concentric circle expanding, we're in the crosshairs. That's not where you want to be when these things happen. But we don't have a choice. We, we are subjected to whatever it spits out. And so that's, that's one of the things that we talk about when we, when we talk about solar astronomy at UT is how important it is to study it. This is another, this is the picture you were talking about. This is the one he took and this is where we had an event on Thursday that everybody found so interesting and not missed. But I got here. <coughs> So thank you, you know. Uh, that's just cool. And this is an under-processed image. He hadn't done much with this yet. Wait till, he, wait till you see the finished product. Uh, and what Dr. G was talking about just a few minutes ago, what she misses, that's the upside of, that's the pretty side of all of this activity. This is how it affects us. If you're farther north, you get to see the activity produced by when this field of hydrogen particles literally wraps around the Earth's magnetic field. They're electrically charged particles. We have a magnetic field. So the magnetic field affects the electrically charged particles and they do one of two things. They're either deflected or they're trapped or attracted to the magnetic field line where they become accelerated as they spiral into the magnetic field. Well, when they come down through the Earth's atmosphere to the North and South Poles, which by the way is where the, the magnetic field strength the Earth's magnetic field is the least powerful. They strip electrons off of oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, et cetera, and we get these beautiful aurora. We've had some at these latitudes since 1989, four that I have seen, two that I have photographed, and we only see the red. We don't see this kind of stuff. And on, on one occasion, did I ever see any sort of curtain effect? That was back in March 24th of 1989 when I saw that, but I've not seen anything like that since. So I, who's had the good fortune to witness this kind of stuff? It, it's amazing to see. Where'd you see it? I saw it at our observatory, actually. Okay, so you saw, you had to see one of the ones I saw, because they, uh, the fact that we, and Jack, you, most of you know Jack McConnell. Jack's colorblind. My brother called me from North Carolina, or from North Carolina, Colorado, and says, what's this red stuff up in the sky? I said, what are you talking, who is this? 
and I recognized it. I hadn't talked to him in 20 years, and, and then I recognized his voice. He said, I said, you're seeing Aurora? And he said, yeah. And then I got to thinking, I said, he's about the same latitude we are. I said, I'll talk to you later. Hung up the phone. <laughs> we left. Jack and his vehicle, me and mine, and we're straight out Interstate 40 to the house. I'm looking out the window, and I'm seeing it all the way home. We pull up in the driveway, and I got out, and I'm going, wow, look at that. And over there, and it's over here. And Jack's standing there. A couple of minutes go by, and he says, what are you talking about? <laughs> I said, you don't see the, and then it dawned on me, he's colorblind. He can't see the red. And it was all, it was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I thought and he was on fire in my house. Yeah, I thought Morristown was on fire in 1989. It was right out there. It was red. Yeah. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Coming home from the birthday party in 1989, and we got home, pull up the driveway. I said, my God, Morristown's on fire. I got out, I started looking at it. That ain't fire. I ran in the house and found a roll of film with the camera for 35 minutes. I photographed it. And the first time I'd ever seen it was spectacular. Not only do we have it, but in this is a rural activity. That's Uranus. So it doesn't just affect us, it sweeps across the entire solar system. And since this is about the sun and the solar system, I thought, well, I should include that. There's no spacecraft out there doing anything. We just had to look at it with Hubble. And Hubble does a little bit of ultraviolet, a little bit of infrared, so this is a little bit of UV in order to pick that up. But here, here's, what's, uh, here's what's really cool. Uh, you know that Uranus doesn't spin up like the rest of us do. Uh, it's going around the solar system on its side. But even weirder than that, this is the rotational axis, which, by the way, this part of it's what I'm pointing out is right now. This is the magnetic field which doesn't even go through the center. It's a third of the radius of the planet where the middle of it is. And so it's really, it's something really, what, really odd about it. I'd have something to do with something knocked it over a long time ago. Nobody really knows for sure. But this is what's so odd about Uranus. I took the slide out. Never mind. I was going to show you one of the big goes on too. So we're going to move away from the sun now, but only just a little bit. Uh, this is Mercury. And uh, the Messenger spacecraft, which has uh, completed its first primary, its first year primary mission uh, is into its extended mission now. And one of the things that we're doing with Mercury, we, they, are doing with Mercury is lowering the orbit of the Messenger spacecraft so that they can get higher resolution images as if these aren't good. Uh, they're spectacular. Uh, on a, this is not, this doesn't do it justice. On the computer screen, it's drop dead gorgeous. Uh, so this is, uh, I don't know the crater names, it's irrelevant. Uh, the, the fact that, is that the images are absolutely spectacular. What's interesting though is look at the color. They're taking these pictures and they're finding all of these unusual colors in these freshly cratered regions on Mercury. And at this point, the spectra is not just quite good enough to give away what they want to know about the composition of the surface. Uh, other studies have been done, magnetic field studies, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the lowering of the altitude of the spacecraft will improve the quality of uh, the imagery to the extent that the spectrographs can begin to reveal more detail. Since this is the end of the primary first year, uh, a lot of this stuff is embargoed, and so not a lot of information has been released. We just sort of get a, a general information releases and that sort of thing. So. We're probably looking at another year before we begin to see big papers on this stuff and new discoveries that are significant and that sort of thing. So I just want to include some pictures. Then this is, uh, it's a mosaic uh, that was done by Messenger. Uh, the first year, 88,746 images were taken. We expect to take 80,000 more in the next year. The lower altitude will allow the spectrum analysis to reveal the surface, co surface composition. Uh, and uh, it, it, the pictures are absolutely amazing. I don't know how much time you spend on the Messenger website, but it's worth a trip. Um, 43 years ago, we landed on the moon. We've got to bring it closer to home now. There, Venus has a spacecraft called Venus Express that's orbiting. It's a European Space Agency thing. Uh, and yeah, you can look that up. We don't have enough time to cover everything in the whole solar system. And I still have a lot to go. Uh, this is, this image compared to this image is basically the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has been flying around the moon for a while and it's been taking pictures of landing sites. 
And so this is the lunar module. That's the Eagle Lander. That's this right here. Sands the return vehicle there. Uh, and uh, the uh, the LRR uh, is the Lunar Ranging Retro Reflector. Now, how many of you know about the green laser out of the Donald Observatory that bounces off the moon? That's what it hits, is that thing. That's the cover for it laying on the ground. That's how good these images are. We can see the cover from the retro reflector laying next to the thing. Uh, and this is the uh, passive seismic experiment. The seismic experiments I don't think are active anymore. Uh, a lot of that equipment used uh, thermal electric generators uh, back then, and uh, I think a lot of that stuff has seen its better day. But the fact that we can see that kind of detail. Uh, this picture, uh, looking down here, would put uh, this angle from back here somewhere. Uh, it's just, uh, it's amazing what that, the, the technology has advanced so much that the camera images are so much better. Uh, just just go and look. I, I can't begin to, to, to show you. <coughs> How many of you know about Grail? Okay, Grail uh, changed the name. Uh, some kids, at some school, somebody came up with a really great idea. These two spacecraft about the size of washing machines. In fact, there's a video. I won't say any more about this. I'll just say that they're flying at 3,600 miles per hour. They're flying at exactly, or were positioned originally at an exact distance apart, uh, and they're constantly in contact with lasers and communication with the Earth. They've been renamed EVA and FLO because one is a leading spacecraft, one's a following. Uh, and there's some cool stuff. So let me, I gotta see if I can find this. This is what I was having a problem with. Again, if I can't find it, we may just skip over it, but uh, let's see. Yep, there it is. Okay, I'm just gonna be quiet and let you We're very eager to get high resolution gravity map of the moon because we really want to study what the moon is made up on this. With gravity, you can see through matter. In other words, you're not restricted to seeing what's on the surface. You can also see what's inside. And that's really a remarkable property that we can use by mapping the gravity field of the moon. First thing we do, actually, once the map is in our hands, is compare it with the topography map, hopefully of comparable resolution. And from there, we can look at specific features, such as mountains and basin craters, and compare the gravity and the topography. This is where it gets really interesting. You would normally think that if there's a mountain present on the uh, planet, there's additional mass and additional gravitational signal as the spacecraft flies over. But if it does, and there is no additional gravity signal, then something on the inside is going on that is particularly interesting. There's a piece and of the moon you can pass around. The upper 60% is known pretty well because the Apollo astronauts placed seismometers on the moon. And for about a half a million years, we have records of moon ranks. As you go deeper, we don't know nearly as much about the size of the core, how big it is. I think there's a mushy zone and how, how mushy the mushy zone is, it's a Understanding how the moon has developed would really help us in understanding how the other planets in the inner part of the solar system, the rocky planets, have also developed. The terrestrial bodies in the inner solar system are the moon and the four planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. The biggest of those bodies, the Earth and Venus, have surfaces that have evolved completely away from the original appearance. So comparative planetology is a very key aspect of planetary science. And understanding yet one more piece of this puzzle with this very interesting project, how the moon would be a key aspect of Maybe to be surprised. Which uh, pollination was that? Rock 16. 16. It's the numbers 6501 and That's Apollo 16, Station 5, 15th Rock, 46th chip out of that rock. Okay. Um, part of this mission, Sally Ride got involved in, and it's called uh, Moon Camp. Uh, moon knowledge acquired by middle school students. Previous, previous, it was previously called Grail Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory. 
A and B, they renamed Ebb and Flow. Uh, and the moon cams, I think there's three on each spacecraft, and they're the same cameras that they use on the solid rocket boosters on the shuttle when they go up. They're not terribly high resolution, as you can see by the image. But can you imagine being a middle school kid and, 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 and uh, uh, tasking a camera on a spacecraft that's orbiting a moon to take a photograph for you? Because that's what they're getting to do. We didn't get to do that stuff when we were kids. Uh, and uh, there were, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, made some comments the other night about how he was concerned about the decreasing budget of NASA and what that's going to mean. Well, more interestingly to me was a group of astronauts were at the landing of the shuttle uh, in Washington when it was set down to do a Barhazi, or to be delivered to the Barhazi. And uh, one of the guys said, you know, NASA's budget, just in case you're wondering, of all the money this country spends, spends in the course of a year, 0.5% is NASA's budget. If we just raised it to 06 we'd probably be working on sending guys to the moon. Just to 0.6. If it, imagine what it would be like if we put 1% of the budget into it. Uh, it is so underfunded and has been for so long uh, that it's just absolutely ridiculous. The coolest thing about that picture is there's Earth up at the top. To be able to look back and see what we do. Uh, and Sally Ride runs the program and she still continues to amaze. And what a great program it is. I'm going to come back to this if we have time uh, because it's 11 minutes long. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Dawn? Uh, Dawn has been busy doing other things, got retasked to go to, go to and, and, and this was a test bed for ion propulsion, electric ion propulsion, uh, and what supplies the electricity for the ion propulsion are these huge solar panels. And so it got retasked to go to Vesta, which it is now orbiting, and it was just this week given 40 more days to continue its survey, and they are lowering the orbit of that spacecraft to get even closer to take higher resolution images. Uh, to see what we can learn about it. It has been suggested in just the last couple of months that Vesta uh, may actually be a failed planet. Uh, that it may actually require reclassifying. Imagine that. Oh, it is. Pluto. But... That's not what it is? Yeah. Because of its makeup. It's really very strange. Oh, it's uh, Biggest the second biggest asteroid. See, it, this, when this spacecraft is through here, it's going to Ceres, the largest. And the only spherical one, at least, that we know of. This is, well, Vesta's kind of spherical, too. Not exactly, but it's close. I think it's 330 miles across. I think Letitia's 30-something miles, uh, just for comparison. And how many of you saw the, uh, <laughs> the moon of Mercury? Did anybody you, you see the moon of Mercury? Okay, you already know, so I'm not going to say it. <laughs> it was in there. <laughs> okay. And just some more imagery from uh, <clears throat> from Vesta, which is um, showing interesting features. Nobody's saying exactly what anything is, because they got to study the data. This is all new stuff. Now, how many of you saw this? You seen it too? Last year? Okay. Uh, this developed. This is a storm that developed. It was first seen December 5th of 2010. This is the largest storm ever photographed on Saturn. Period. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to go through all this other than uh, it went from uh, what was it, 1,600 miles north to south uh, to 6,000 miles, and it was spread out over 62,000 miles at some point. Uh, this is a sequence from December 8th, 2010 to August 12th, 2011. So the storm was still active. I think I, I made a comment in, in here uh, about its, the length of activity of this thing, and I think I misspoke when I wrote what I did. This is high-resolution color enhanced. This is a whole planet at that latitude. This is just a couple of frames to show different contrast enhancements and so forth so that you can see how uh, complex this thing actually is. It was an amazing thing to watch the first time I saw it. I thought, wow, we got another white spot already. We used to see these about every 30 years. Uh, and they've happened more frequently than that. And it usually is among it that boils up from beneath the surface of the planet and then just freezes out when it expands above the surface clouds of Saturn when, the, when it gets there. Uh, this is a near true color image. 
And the reason it's near true color is because the red filter is not exactly the right red filter, but it's what they had, so that's as close as they could get. If you could fly past Saturn, that's probably what it would look like, not this. So the color enhancement means a lot to show us detail that we, that we just wouldn't otherwise see. You can hear anybody. Now, I thought it was important to suggest size differences, Saturn and, and, and the Earth, of course. And we just showed the storm on Saturn. This is the largest hurricane ever recorded in the North Atlantic, or in the Atlantic Ocean. And it was a, a hurricane called Igor, or Igor, depending on which movie you watch. Uh, and uh, this, I don't know what the size was, but that was from 20, uh, 2010. Uh, it is an enormous hurricane. You can get a sort of a feel for the size of this thing. Here's Texas over here. This thing's actually larger than the state of Texas. And the hurricane, hurricane winds were measured from 90 miles from the eye of the storm. That's enormous. Here's a comparison to show you the size of Enceladus, which is 313 miles in diameter, and Epimetheus, which is 70 miles in diameter. This is the thickness of the rings of Saturn. This was at, uh, I think, near uh, uh, the Saturn equinox. Uh, and it's about, uh, what, 100, 200 feet thick at the most. And this is what's cool. Enceladus, you probably have seen some of these pictures that show the geysers outside of it, or coming up off of Enceladus. Well, let me back up here. This is what's cool about this. That, mag that, 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 that solar energy, those coronal mass ejections, those high energy particles go streaming out across the solar system, have interacted with the giant magnetic field of Saturn, and this is a roar in Saturn's atmosphere. But more importantly, here's its own little world circle right here, which is produced by high energy protons that are in this magnetic field that are directly related to Enceladus. So it's creating its own auroral activity in the atmosphere of Saturn, uh, which is just really cool. So the sun's not the only one doing it. Can, and Io probably is Jupiter too. <clears throat> this is a close-up. The, the, the latest images that have been released from Cassini are still raw images, so they're not processed properly, and it's difficult to make a lot of detail. On. But this shows the texture of the surface of Enceladus uh, and, and what kind of terrain is actually uh, on the surface. Well, here we oh, see. Last, last week or a couple weeks ago when these were released. Yeah. At a billion miles. Yeah. 48 miles off the surface. Yeah. Yeah, I think this one will build. This is 115 miles away. Yeah, this isn't the closest. This yeah. was this was both. When I saw that, I thought, well, I'm not going to look for anything else. That's unbelievable. Uh, I can't wait till they process it. Uh, it's really going to be an amazing thing to see. And this, I just put the dates on there so that you can give you an idea of where the spacecraft was in relation. Uh, March 28th, uh, this is a contrast enhanced version uh, of this one from the 27th. And uh, I actually fooled with the, the, the contrast a little bit to do that uh, and then cut it up and stuck it up there so you could see some more of this. Uh, but you remember back when, when Galileo was at Jupiter and it was looking at uh, 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 Europa. And we could see, they call them tiger, tiger stripes, and this, this thing that we saw on, uh, first seen on Earth, at Earth's north polar regions on the ice shelves, was this place where in the springtime where the warmer waters soften the ice and the ice shelf gets thinner, it cracks and breaks and sort of floats away and rotates and then refreezes. And then it does it again, and then it does it again, and it does it again. And pretty soon what you have is a jigsaw puzzle. You can look back at these things and you can say, well, if you took that piece and you rotated it this much, you put it against that one, then you would see that linear feature would extend, and that's the same thing. Well, the same thing is being seen, more or less, on Enceladus. There's not as much rafting going on, but there is floor spreading that's happening. And uh, that's indicated by, I can't tell by looking at the three different frames, but that's what NASA said, so I'm just going to go with that for now. But that's what they're saying is you're getting, like plate tectonics, you're getting some, some plates of ice that are moving apart, sliding against each other, and it's in these tiger stripes, these trenches, when they spread out enough, it gets thin enough, that water beneath in that layer comes flying up through the thing until it refreezes back and shuts down, another one pops out someplace else. 
This is the ice rafting from Europa. And you can see what I was talking about where you just take these pieces, cut them all out, start turning them around, piece them back together. You see that's part of this and so on and so forth. You've got, uh, this is actually broken and done this here and here. Uh, I was fortunate to be in on a uh, teleconference where they talked about this and it was absolutely fascinating to talk about their description of this. That was a number of years ago. And then finally, um, wow, I can go back to the other thing if you want to see it. Uh, Pluto, the, the New Horizons mission is en route to Pluto. Uh, it's now over halfway there. And uh, these are recent images uh, taken of the four moons of Pluto, Charon, Hydra, Nix, and P4. Doesn't have a name yet, but uh, who knows how many, if any more, will be discovered by New Horizons when it flies by. Highest resolution, color contrast enhanced images of enough of it to see the entire surface of the planet. All we know is that it has the highest, second highest reflective material and the most light absorbing material, second only to Earth in the solar system. So we await its arrival and fly by and then on into the Kuiper Belt and whatever wonders exist beyond that. Uh, do we even want to try to do the other video? Sure. Can you show the next picture of the solar material by the top? Did you get an next picture? No, I get it. No, I did not. I didn't see it. Was it up already? Oh, oh, I didn't look again. Okay. I got a bunch of heads nodded yes. And if you need to stop it, just say stop. Whoop, what happened? Oh, we gotta do this. Paul will have some overflow time past that with uh, with Tom because he's, he's the last presentation, so super okay. Yeah. Okay, with you? Okay. Uh, if you have not if you are not familiar with curiosity, this is worth it. Uh, you remember uh, Spirit and Opportunity and the seven minutes of hell uh, as it went down through the atmosphere, the balloons popped up and then there's the boing, boing, boing bounce on the surface and you're going, oh my God, look how much money we just bounced on the surface of Mars and would it work? And it did. And we're now nine years into the 90 day warranty with uh, uh, well, the first little guy, Spirit died finally and they put it to rest. And now Opportunity has started its summer or spring, late spring journey again. But here's curiosity. This is going to arrive in uh, August of this year, hopefully.